So, uh, I'm Garth, this is Richard, there's our Twitter handles down there. Uh, I talk for a living. Richard, do you want to say a few things about yourself? Yeah, well, yeah that's wonderful. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> um, so, what's a bestiary? Okay, so a bestiary is like a medieval compendium of interesting beasts, okay? So, uh, what we're going to be looking at in this talk is a compendium of functional programming concepts, okay? And we only have half an hour and about 90 minutes worth of material, okay? So, we're going to be talking really quickly, okay? So, uh, Richard is a far better developer than I am, but I am twice as arrogant and talk an awful lot faster, okay? So, the idea is that I'll be taking you through the first two bits here. So, we're going to be talking about, first of all, simple things with scary names. These are functional programming patterns that you've probably heard about before but never had formally defined. So we're going to talk about a bunch of those. Yeah. Uh, then we're going to talk about complicated things. Complicated things that are coming from the world of functional programming into the languages that you know and love. Okay. So these things are going to be hitting you uh, in the next six months if they're not hitting you right now. Okay. And then finally, uh, the future that is to come, which is ROFX. And at that point, I run out of brain power. Yeah. So I will be switching the mic to Richard, and uh, he'll be going through a little demo, if time allows, okay? So, all I can say is, if you must blink, do it now, okay? So, uh, any fans of Kubo and the Two Strings? Who knows the movie? Yay! For everybody else, there's your homework. Go watch the movie, okay? Um, so, first of all, an overarching big idea, okay? Uh, functions as values, okay? So, uh, we're going to take Kotlin as our language because at Instill we're heavily invested in it and it's great, you know? So, uh, if you see there, we've got an add function and we've got a subtract function, okay? Uh, the add function is declared in the standard way. The subtract function is declared as a, a constant variable which contains a reference to a lambda, okay? So, so we're using functions as values, okay? Functions as values. You will hear me say this a couple million more times in this talk, okay? Uh, so the advantage of having functions as values is that if you're using a framework like Arrow, which Richard knows a little bit about, yeah? Uh, you know a little bit about that, Richard, don't you? Oh, wonderful. Yes, good. Okay. So, uh, so you can do stuff like you can do partial invocation. Okay. So uh, subtract takes two things, but we can partially invoke it and get back a function that has the 34 hardwired. And then uh, we only need to pass one other thing in. Okay. Or we can go the whole way and we can curry it. Okay. So we can take a function that let's say takes four inputs and turn that into a chain of functions where we pass in one input, we get back another function that takes another input, we get back another function that takes another input, yada, 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 uh, until we get back Back the uh, the final result yeah or we could compose functions together okay so let's say we've got square half and print and uh, we want to have one function that calls one after the other well we could say print compose half compose square yeah but that's back to front which hurts my head so we could say square and then half and then print and that would be all good okay so uh, whenever you have functions as values you can start doing marvelous things okay and that's kind of the, the overarching lesson of this talk Okay. But part one, uh, simple things with scary names. Okay. So who's into domain driven design? Show of hands. Okay. So, right. <laughs> okay. That's, uh, that's four people in the audience. That's good. Okay. So, uh, so in DDD, there's this wonderful idea of a bounded context. Okay. So, uh, a bounded context is just where we have our language and you have yours. Okay. So you could have somebody from sales, uh, and somebody from marketing or shipping or whatever in the room, and they could be both talking about orders, but using the term order in a completely different way. Okay. So, you know, when you're in a bounded context, when you have your own little language, yeah, that only means something to your culture. So we have two bounded contexts, okay? We've got the bounded context of OO, which we all know very well, okay? So there's a little bit of internet humor that's been going around recently. Uh, this is the bounded context of OO, okay? So uh, we don't have a TV remote control. We have an entertainment provider view controller, okay? To the average Spring Boot developer, that makes perfect sense, okay? And uh, we don't have window blinds. We have a privacy manager delegate, you know, and so on, okay? So we have the bounded context of OO, and then we have the bounded context of functional programming. Okay, so uh, this was from Lambda Conf 24 hours ago. So this was somebody trying to illustrate their bounded context. Okay. And we all have to get along, okay? Just like those of us that know that Babylon 5 is the best show ever produced, yeah, have to get along with those idiots who think that Lords of, Lord of the Rings is a good book. You know, you know, silly, 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 silly people, yes. Anyway, so we all have to get along. We all have to take a walk 
into each other's bounded context, okay? So that's what we're going to do here, okay? So these are some of the scary sounding terms from the bounded context of functional programming, okay? But they're not really that scary, okay? Hence, we're going to go through them at light speed. So you have functors, okay? A functor is just any container which is mappable, okay? Simple idea, okay? You have a value, the value lives in the box. You want to be able to transform the value while staying in the same box, okay? So you have a, a functor and you can map it. Very simple demo here. Uh, you see we've got this function as a value yeah, called uh, property and that's just going to call system get property and wrap up the result in option or optional if you do Java here. Okay? So uh, uh, java.vendor, yep, there'll be one of those so that'll be a sum. Java.wibble, last I heard there wasn't one of those so that'll be a none. Okay? So either way we're getting back a box, an option which is either a sum or a none and we can map over it. Okay? So you now know what a functor is. Yep. Uh, you can also have an endofunctor, okay? So normally whenever we teach functors and mapping, we say you're doing a transformation, okay? But if you think about the last one, we weren't really transforming the type. We were going from string to string. We weren't going from string to date or string to person or something like that, okay? So if you're doing a mapping, but you're just uh, changing the thing without changing the type, then it's an endofunctor. So uh, all good. You now know what that is as well. Uh, then what about a bifunctor? Okay. Well, then uh, a bifunctor is where you're going to have two potentially valid values. Okay. So uh, if you think about an option, well, you either have the result or nothing. Okay. If you think about a future, well, the value is either not there or it is there. You know, it's turned up in the future. Okay. But let's say we're talking about a type like either. Okay. So in an either type, you have a left and you have a right. Okay. And they're both valid. Okay. So let's say we've got a, um, a value that we know is up to date and then we've got the last cached value, whatever that happens to be, okay? But they can both be used, okay? So in either is what you, when you've got two values and uh, they're both good, they could both be used, okay? But the right is righteous, okay? That's the way to remember it, okay? So whenever we're doing this kind of thing that the right one is always the one that we favor, okay? So uh, I've written a little uh, uh, function here called property or else and you can see what we're doing is we're going to go and look up a system property, but we're also going to accept a default value. So if you look down in main there, we're going to say property or else, and we want the value of java.vendor or invalid, okay? So what we want to do is we want to have two options, okay? So we're not just going to map over it, we're going to do a by map, okay? And uh, we'll pass in two functions, uh, one to be called for the left value, one to be called for the right value, okay? And as you can see, it works, okay? So uh, a by map uh, with a by functor is just like a map with a functor, except that you've got two values that could both work, okay? Uh, then the next one, an applicative, yeah? So uh, this is the first one that's slightly scary, okay? Uh, let me just proceed directly to the demo. So uh, let's say we've got a function called concat, yeah? And we want to apply it to two options, okay? So if you look there in main, we're going to get OPT1 and OPT2, and uh, we want to call concat, okay? That, that's our problem, okay? How are we going to do that, yeah? Well, uh, the first thing that you see there I'm going to do is I'm going to curry concat. Okay, we're going to get concat curry. So uh, now what we're going to get is a function that takes an input that returns a function that takes an input that returns a value. Okay, and then uh, I'll go to op2 and I'll map with concat curry. Okay, so what's that going to return? Well, that's going to return a box that contains a lambda. Okay, uh, so now uh, what we can do is we can apply that to opt1. Okay, so an applicative is something that you can apply, and uh, the important thing and apply is that you're passing in a box, in this case an option, that doesn't contain a value, it contains a lambda, okay? And you want to apply that lambda to whatever is in the box on the left, okay? Yes, of course. One more slide? Yep. Absolutely. 
Cool, very good. So that's the, that's the first one that's a little bit of a head scratcher. Uh, then a semi-group, what the hell's that? Well, that's just where you have two values and you want to be able to combine them so that the main operation is uh, combined. Yep. Then getting to the ones you may have heard of, uh, what's uh, a monoid? Okay. Well, uh, monoid is just semi-group plus plus, yep. and uh, it has an empty method that returns an identity value. Now, what the hell's an identity value? Anybody doing Java 8? Yay, cool. Uh, so if you're doing Java 8 and uh, you're using the Streams API, you may have heard the term identity used a lot, like uh, in the reduce function, for example. So the identity value is something that is a valid value but doesn't change the operation. Okay. So if you think about addition, zero. Okay. Because uh, you can say plus zero, you're not going to change the additional value. Uh, multiplication, multiply it by one. Okay. Concatenation, the empty string, and so on. Okay. So with a you have uh, an empty method which gives you back the uh, the identity value uh, and then we've got monad yeah so monad extends monoid hence a monad is just a monoid remember that you'll hear it in a minute yeah uh, and it adds flat map okay so uh, here's the best way to understand why flat map is useful let's say we set ourselves a task or rather your manager ruins your day by setting you a task and he says okay uh, here's the the string foo you have to find the value of that virtual machine property, okay? So go and find the value of the property foo, and that will give you the result. But that result is itself the name of a property, so go look that up. And that result is itself the name of a property, so go look that up, and that will give you the answer that you want, okay? So let's say we know that foo is the name of a property, so we need to look that up. And let's say for our test, that will give us bar, so then we want to look that up, and that will give us z, and then we want to look that up, and that will give us eureka. You know, and that's what we're after. Okay, so uh, we could say property foo, and uh, we well, don't need to put in the types here, but I've added them just to make the code obvious. So we can get back an option of string, and then we can actually say result one dot map property of it. But what that will give us is an option of an option of string. Okay, so you can see the problem here. Uh, all we want is a box with a value, but now what we're getting is a box with a box with a value. Okay, and uh, and that's not good. Now, Richard, cover your eyes. You don't want to see this. Okay. So we could do this. <laughs> okay. So uh, I could write uh, property opt, which takes an optional and then says, okay, look inside the optional box. And if it is a sum, pull out the value, <laughs> you know, and uh, I could get a result down here and I could say, okay, this is an option inside an option and so on. So I could say, okay, you know, uh, if it's a sum, then open it up. And if that's a sum, then open it up and print the value. Now, okay. Uh, we don't want to do that. Okay, that, that's not going to scale, that's not going to be good. Okay, but what we can do instead is uh, we can call flat map. Okay, so whenever we call flat map, we're doing a mapping, but we're also doing a flattening. Okay, so we're saying unpack the value from the box that it's currently in. Okay, so the advantage of doing a flat map is that we can just keep calling it, and each time we just get a value inside a box. Okay, and uh, we can continue this chain of calls for as long as we like. Okay. What this means is that in the case of an option in this case, it's that we have a pipeline. Yes. So we have a bunch of fun uh, functions, each returning the same option type, or the same wrapper type. And if you have that, then you can chain these calls together. So if you think about something like, uh, instead of options, it's a bit of infamous. So you, uh, you get one asynchronous operation. With the result of that, then pass that through to another asynchronous operation. So you get something very positive in this case. Yep. Very good. Yeah. And then anything you're working uh, with something that's a monad, yeah, well then uh, you can use this syntax here if you're using arrow with Kotlin and so on. So we can say binding, and then at the end of each call we can say bind. So you don't have to manually call the flat map, okay? It's done for you in the background, yeah? And uh, that produces a much nicer syntax, okay? So uh, monads, monadic composition, pipelines, and so on, the, this is uh, the kind of the polymorphism of OO, okay? or FP, I should say. So this is the apparently scary thing that once you learn is actually incredibly useful and isn't really that complicated. Okay, Once you've seen it enough times, it's not really that complicated. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, so hopefully now you can see, yeah, that a, uh, a monad is just a, uh, sorry, a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors. Okay. So you hear things like this now. Okay. But it's like whatever you were at college and were introduced to polymorphism and encapsulation and all that kind of stuff for the first time, and it all sounded like total voodoo until it became obvious. Okay. It's not really that hard. Right. So moving on to part two. Complicated things coming your way, okay? These are the things you're going to be hearing about over the next six months and so on. First of all, algebraic data types. What the hell is that, okay? Well, let me show you some F-sharp. Uh, you see at the bottom there, we've got a student type, and we're saying a student is made up of a student ID, some experience, and an employer. Okay, that, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, whenever we do types in OO, we're used to doing it with and. We're saying this thing is that thing, and the other thing, and the other thing. Okay, but you can also build types using or. Okay, so if you look here, uh, we've got this type called experience, and experience is either going to be a coding. What the hell is a coding? Well, it's something called relevant, which is an int for relevant experience, and then something called additional, which is also an int for additional experience. Yeah, so your experience can be a coding of those two things there. Or it could be QA, because you could have QA experience, you know? So it could be QA, which is an int. Or it could be sysadmin, which is int. Or it could be degree, which is string, okay? So we're saying here that this type called student has a student ID, but then experience, which is one of those types above, okay? So whenever you're building your type systems using ands and ors, okay, that's an algebraic data type, okay? And it turns out this is really useful in DDD. This is really useful for doing modeling with the customer. You know, users can understand this. Maybe we shouldn't be moving to it. You know? uh, but, you know, algebraic data types, yeah, uh, building type systems with ands and ors. But very interesting, okay? Uh, next one, higher kinded types, okay? So all those patterns we were talking about, ooh, way back three minutes ago, yeah? Uh, those are just shapes, okay? Those are like high level shapes for how you can do design in an FP world, okay? And you're gonna wanna combine them together in interesting ways. So if you're a library writer, it's really helpful to be able to say, there's this type T, but T is itself a generic type. Okay, so uh, that's where higher kinded types come in. Okay, so this is the syntax that you would have in Scala. Okay, so if you were paying attention to the, the Kotlin demos a minute ago, there was a lot of kind angle brackets, A comma B, maybe A comma B comma C and so on. Okay, so that's their way of doing higher kinded types. This is the Scala way. Okay, so you see here we're saying there is some type T, which is itself a generic type that takes one type parameter. Okay, so you see here it could be list, it could be set, it could be option, it could be future, okay? But it couldn't be map, yeah, because map requires two type parameters itself, okay? So it's very useful in your type system to be able to say, okay, there's this type that we're representing by T, but we're also going to show that it itself is a generic type which requires N type parameters, okay? So for list or option, N would be one, for map it would be two, for pair it would be two, for triple it would be three, you get the idea. We yep. can also do some other things here in that we can put a context on T to say that T could maybe be one of these monads or a monoid or I'm forgetting. So if we have where it's a where this T and these empty brackets are here, we could actually put a some sort of context uh, like a higher binding there. So we can say it has to confirm uh, conform to certain restrictions or something like that. Very good. Yep. Uh, and then the final one. And this you're really going to hear about, type classes, okay? So uh, type classes are how we glue together data uh, with functions. It's done in a slightly different way from OO, yeah? But we can actually do it now in... Um, in mainstream OO programming languages. So Kotlin, for example, has a proposal, sorry for flicking backwards and forwards, uh, a proposal called Keep87, and uh, this is adding type classes to Kotlin, and a lot of people are getting interested about it, okay? So this is from a, a blog post that just came out 48 hours ago, okay? Uh, about how uh, type classes in Kotlin are really interesting. So what the hell is it? Well, let's say we've got an interface called converter. That's nicely OO. So uh, we want to be able to take a type T, let's say person, and marshal it to some format. Let's say JSON. Yeah. And then we want to be able to go the other way. We want to unmarshal. And then we want to be able to extend the types. So that's an extension function there. So we want to be able to say person.report. Okay. 
So uh, I'll implement that interface. You see here we've got a, a JSON converter, and that can marshal uh, a person object into JSON in a really ugly way, you know. And uh, it can unmarshal a person in an even more ugly way. Feel the evilness of the regular expression, you know. Uh, I had to put in the, the so sue me comment so none of you would hunt me down afterwards, you know. But it works, okay. And then uh, we've got a, a, a report method as well that we're adding to the person type, okay. So what all this is building up to is that we can do this kind of thing here. So we can say a function called test that takes input of type person with converter, converter of person, okay? That second parameter, we don't pass it in, okay? The compiler goes out and finds it for us, okay? So it's like dependency injection, but it's dependency injection done at compile time, okay? So because we're saying with, uh, the compiler has to go out and find an implementation of converter that works for the type parameter person, okay? And it does this in extremely well-defined search order, okay? And then once it's found it, well then we can marshal a person, we can unmarshal a person, and we can ask a person to report itself, okay? So this idea of type classes, this is how in more purest functional languages we join together data structures with functions, okay? And uh, it's a very flexible way of doing it, okay? So coming to Kotlin, yeah, already there in Swift is something they call contracts, you know, uh, coming to other languages as well. Jonah? Yeah. yeah, and also, I mean, so if you're thinking you're writing a library uh, hmm. that's working with JSON in this case, you can you can create these converters, you can create these in your API calls, and that means that anyone that's using your library just has to create in a separate place their converter to whatever object they're wanting to go to. As long as that con conforms to that converter to the interface, they can create that in a separate file. They don't have to do anything with it. I'll give you an entire concern thing like that. Just create the transformations. And Yep. Yep. So this gives you the benefits of OOO -O -O, plus the benefits of dependency injection with no runtime cost or extra frameworks or anything like that. Okay. So stage one was the patterns. Stage two was new interesting things coming at you. Stage three is the future that is to come. And for my remaining time, I hand it over to Richard. Yep. Okay. So uh, let's see. So yeah. We've been talking about all these patterns, and yeah, we can take a function and we can combine them together, these, these things together, or we can sequence them, or we can do all that sort of stuff, but how do you actually use these in the real world? So um, the whole idea is that with functional programming is, as I say, it's composing functions into larger functions to, to create a program, to eventually be able to create programs. But all of this stuff is talking about pure functions. What, you know, what do you do when you want to talk to a database? What do you do when you want to make a network call or anything like that? So the idea in pure FP is that we create programs that tell us what we're going to do, make the instructions of what we're going to do, and then we push that sort of those things that we call effects or side effects to the edge of the world. Okay, so we we create a program. We, we understand exactly what it's going to do, and then we run it. We, we run it in, our execute, in the context that we want, we've described. And to do this, we use a thing which was called I.O. So what's I.O.? This is another type, uh, like option, like either. And the idea is that, you know, as you see at the bottom here, we're going to uh, produce a value A. Uh, an I.O. of type A will produce your value, maybe a string or a unit or, or whatever you're wanting to do at the end of your program. It can either produce the value, it can fail, or it could never terminate as well. So you can keep these things running like web servers or things like this. The idea is that with I.O., we describe a set of operations that are to be executed, and then we just, those are deferred, so they're lazy, and, that, and with that, we're going to actually build up another data type, okay, that then we can take, move around, and dis decide when we want to actually execute it. And just to say as well, um, I'm actually probably hopefully going to be doing a talk in the Kotlin user group in a few months' time, so if anyone wants to know more about this, Arrow have made a DSL to actually show how to run these things. So you saw that flat map stuff and things like that. There's a DSL to try to make that a lot uh, easier to use in a more of an imperative form. So uh, in this case, you can see, so we have this sort of I.O. here where we're going to go and ask for course IDs. We're going to flat map to get the results. Get strings, flat map, get an ID for, uh, that somebody's putting in, and then you know, delete something, 
all that stuff that can then be moved up into a much more imperative form using this FX DSL. As I said, we'll be showing a lot more detail of that, get an hour or two, an hour to, to do that at a later date. Okay, so demo. Just to show you that this is actually possible, um, one sec, thanks. <laughs> we'll be fine. Plenty of time for questions. Okay, so we've got an impair on the left hand side. Can every just one second, we'll just make this bigger. If everyone can see this, this is about as imperative a program as we could think up in a few lines. So this is a little console application. Can everyone see this? Yeah. I'll make it a bit bigger. So the idea is we, c we print a menu that people can choose, mix them up, uh, make a choice of options on a console. We can, uh, where we're going to hold a little bit of state. We can add, so we can either add a string, uh, get one from, uh, add a string to a list, that's our state that we're keeping in our console app, get one from, get one from uh, a string back from a specific position, get a random one, remove something, print something, or quit the program. And it's just a very standard sort of uh, pro uh, program where we're running in a loop, we print the menu, whenever we wait and read the line, we block and read what's coming in from the user, if it's add, we add, etc, get, random, remove, and, and so on. So what's wrong with this problem? How can we make this into a pure FP program? Well, as I said, we just want to do the same operations, but we want to defer this. So let me just change to the I.O. version of this. Now, there's a little bit more uh, just ceremony in here just to get started with, but um, as, you, as you build larger programs, you can see why this stuff is quite advantageous. So let me just make this bigger. So and how... The idea is that we're moving all the I.O. operations to the edge of the program, so the central bit of the program remains pure and empty. So we want to print a line. Okay, so the idea is that when we print, that's something that's side-affecting. That's something that's out of our control, and we don't... Uh, uh, we don't have, uh, as a program, we're not able to um, tell what's going to happen with that. So that's something that happens in the environment. So we want to try to contain that. So what we've done here is instead we've wrapped this in this I.O. type. So what that does is that's, this is actually returning an object that when run will print, okay? So it's just a pure data structure. It's not, it's not actually carrying out anything. So you, if anyone's interested, um, the actual, this here is basically a constructor for I.O. that will take a thunk. So it, uh, what it's doing is it's, it's taking something that's lazy that will uh, be executed when run. Get so that's how we get So that, of course, will return an I.O. of type unit. Unit is the equivalent in Kotlin of Java's void, but we get actually can model the type. Get stir line is exactly the other way around. We want to actually have something that, when executed, can read a line from the console. And so, uh, yeah, just for safety, we're just going to say get something, and if it's null, then we, we have a, an empty string coming through. Next int, again, something that's random, a random number generator like that, we don't have any control over it, so we want to actually uh, wrap that into something that's lazy so that we can uh, compose that into our program. Okay, so just to show you a little bit more, um, yeah, sorry, parsing ints. The other thing that we can do with I.O., we can handle errors, so as we were saying earlier on. So uh, in this case, we want to take our, take our string, cast it, to an, or cast it to an int, and if there's a problem, then we're able to actually handle the error with that. Okay, so read integer, this is where we start to uh, combine these things together. So with a read integer, what we want to do is take the string that's from the, the user gives us and then combine it with next int. So in this case, what we've done is we've used this little FX um, idea, taken, got our IO, from, uh, IO of string from gets their line. That's our input. I, if, if every, I don't know if you can see this, but if I remove this bang symbol from the DSL, you'll see actually we've got an IO of string. When we put that in, that actually unwraps the type and takes the type out of that. And with that result, then, we can call parse int. And the result of that all is an IO of int. Lost everyone yet? No. So this is the idea. We, we have an effect. That's, our, that's how we're going to work with our outside environment. That's called I.O. And uh, sorry, just to say, so 
it, that could be an error, that could be something that's w uh, working with the database. Actually, it could be a resource, like a file that needs to be closed at certain points as well. It could also be something that's asynchronous as well. So the IO monad, it, it has um, uh, concurrency and parallelization uh, operations as well, which are incredibly inf inf uh, efficient and actually really elegant and nice to use. We're not gonna use those here, but yeah, we can show them later on. Okay, so just to wrap up time, okay, so, <laughs> so just to show you, what we're doing here is we've got these functions, they return I.O., and then we just compose them, combine them together to make larger programs. So we have a print unit, a print menu to actually, uh, to, to lift our uh, string, our, our menu into an I.O., and then we have a command loop. Again, it's the same idea as before. We're gonna print the menu, get the string, get our command, take our new state from uh, this function further on down here, and then uh, deciding on whether it's a quit or not, Go, go again. So instead of using a while loop, we're going to use recursion because that's what we're doing, FP. Um, yeah, and just to show you, then we also have our little ADT here as well, just to be able to pattern match to say if it's an add, get, random, print, put. So what we, wh what we end up with here is a pure program. It does absolutely nothing. It's just a data structure, and we need to run this thing. So when we get down to our main, what we can do is we can run uh, just using, uh, they have some horrible scary words like unsafe and run blocking. Uh, unsafe just to say that this is something that's going, that could blow up. Uh, we run it in here and that's us done. So. Um, take it from us, it works. Oh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, get, uh, sorry, we're running through this really fast. Uh, just to show as well. <laughs> oh, you're all good then. Okay, so just to show as well, what we were talking about earlier with these higher kinded types, that IO type, it, uh, it uh, adheres to certain interfaces. One's called a monad defer, meaning a monad that you is lazy that can be deferred to a later state. Uh, also, that FX syntax as well uh, needs uh, has an interface as well. So what I can do instead of doing all this against I/O, I can do this as a polymorphic type, which is called you can see kind f string. So these are looking really similar. Instead of saying I/O of string for gets their line, it says kind f of string. What we've done is we've made that I/O wrapper type polymorphic. Uh, right now, we, uh, sorry, next minor version, a release of Arrow will be able to, instead of using IO there, you can use RX and just inject that in or uh, uh, Flux uh, reactor stuff as well. So uh, you, can, you can use that and inject that in as, instead. Yep. You, you so know that bit in the Simpsons talk where the big hook comes in? <laughs> <and grabs laughs> so, and yep, we're all done. We're uh, done. If anyone wants to see any more of this, I can show you more code and talk about it yep. after. Okay. Come, come talk to us. The slides are available. There will be a gift repo. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers.